Namaste to all of you and welcome all of you to this morning show which is pretty unusual for us because normally we conduct our sessions in the evenings. Uh, but anyway, welcome all of you to the show. And as you already noticed from the thumbnail that we're going to discuss the claims which have been put forward by an eminent historian called Audrey Trushki or Audrey Trushka. I, I really don't know what the correct pronunciation of her name is. So I'll try to stick to Audrey Trushke. Now, yesterday I had announced that I'll be uh, contesting her claims regarding Aurangzeb on Twitter. And uh, today morning I found out that she has blocked me. So that is fine by me. Although we are going to have an academic discussion, but that is the first indication, not I should not say first indication, that is a very strong indication that she knows the mischief that she has been carrying out. Now, she has made a claim. Her claim is that Aurangzeb was not a bad ruler. He was just a product of his times. And it is later on by colonial Britishers that his image has been uh, sullied. And later on by the right wing Hindus whom she used, uses, oh, sorry, whom she calls Hindutva Vadis. Okay. So, and she, her claim is that Aurangzeb is a very misunderstood person. He was actually not a very bad ruler, not a despot, not, not a bigot. He was just an ordinary guy and I'm going to contest all these claims today. Now, what has happened is uh, about two years ago in 2019, she had come to India and de delivered a lecture in Delhi. So today I'll be taking references from that lecture in which she was trying to establish uh, Aurangzeb as a benign or if not exactly benign, not a very despotic ruler. So let us get started with it. What I've done is I've taken screenshots from her lecture and uh, here it goes. Here is the first one. Now, what she's trying to say is that it is a colonial propaganda. Uh, on what basis she's saying so, I don't know. And we're going to find out today how she is trying to portray the entire narrative regarding Aurangzeb to be a colonial propaganda. For this, what, what she does is she picks up a paragraph from a book which was written by two British historians, Eliot and Dawson. Now, Eliot and Dawson were uh, colonial officials in India and they have uh, translated a very large amount of books which were written in Arabic and Persian during the medieval rule. And all these translations they have compiled into eight volumes. The title of the volumes is History of India as told by its own historians. And there are eight volumes in all. Now what she claims is that it is a bad work of history. It is bad academic work. and to support her claims, she picks up a paragraph from their preface. Let us hear out what she actually says. Here it is. Not to where we are today. With a mythical Aurangzeb, envisioned as a sort of proto-ISIS, anti-Hindu, genocidal maniac, the Osama bin Laden of his day. Note the title change in this play on the cover of my Aurangzeb book. This cartoon villain, Aurangzeb, really dates to the British colonial period. Now, this audience surely needs no rehearsal of basic colonial history. But let me point out to you something that is probably quite obvious. The British had a tough sell job. How do you even begin to attempt justifying the colonial enterprise, which was brutal, exploitative, and at its core, racist? One way that the British tried to argue that colonialism was necessary was to say that they were at least better than the rulers who came before them, of which they held up Aurangzeb as the chief exemplar. 
The British emphasized the alleged bigotry and alleged anti-Hindu activities of Aurangzeb and other Indo-Muslim rulers in order to present themselves as even-handed rulers by comparison. So, if you heard this much from her, what she's her the case she's trying to make is that the Britishers tried to portray him as a bigot, and it was British colonial propaganda, and they were trying to juxtapose their own rule as more benign, as more uh, benevolent to the Indian Indian masses as compared to the rule of Muslims. Okay, let's move further now. Crucially, the British ex advanced this propaganda through scholarship. For instance, in the 1860s and 1870s, Henry Elliott and John Dowson produced the eight volume History of India as told by its own historians. Many have mistaken this series as objective, and that's because it contains translations of primary source text. Right? What could be more objective than going back to the source? Now, in reality, Elliot and Dowson selected excerpts and then translated them in certain ways, specifically with the goal of showing Indo-Muslim rulers to be vicious despots. Okay, so that's her case. What she's saying is that this was just colonial propaganda and it was not genuine history. Now, we can live with that. We know that the Britishers were very rapacious rulers. They looted and plundered India, took the wealth from India back to Britain. And that is how they gained their present affluence. We agree with that. But does that make the Islamic rulers less despotic? What she is saying, OK, uh, let's watch her for a few more seconds, then I'll come to my point. That agenda, they openly admitted it. In the preface, excuse me, to volume one of the history of India, Eliot openly extols, quote, the supremacy of the British colonial government. Okay, so that's it. Now look at the title she's put in her slides, Colonial Era Propaganda. And then she's picking up one paragraph from the preface of that book, where they are openly writing, the authors are openly writing that, yes, we are trying to project the despotic rule of the Islamists and in comparison to those uh, despotic rulers, our rule is comparatively benign. That is the entire claim that she is making. Now, my point is that it may all be correct what she is saying, but if they were academically wrong, what needs to be done is you have to point out that the translations are faulty. Now, when I have been a teacher of physics, not of history, but when I had to write a book on history, I used to refer to this eight volume set very frequently. And I also had this lingering doubt that since they were colonial masters, maybe they committed some sort of mischief during translation. That is why the excerpts that I used in my book, I cross verified them. I, I don't know Persian, I don't know Arabic, I don't know Chittai. That is why I consulted all those quotes with a very senior person who was well conversant with Persian as well as Arabic. So what I'm saying is that this is a very scholarly work by Elliot and Dawson, which has survived the test of time for more than what 175 years. And academically, there is nothing wrong. The translations are perfectly fine. The only minor points which can be contested are that is if in the original text, somewhere it is written Allah or Parvardigar or Khuda, they have been translated as God. Now, these are very minor changes and they do not disturb the original narrative. So this claim of Audrey Trishke is very flimsy because she has, she has not put any uh, evidence that the translations that they did were wrong, which is very bad history and very bad academ academics. Now, let us move on to her second ploy. The second ploy that she makes is she quotes some portions of Aurangzeb's correspondence with different rulers. Now, in this case, he's uh, quoting a letter which was written by Aurangzeb to a uh, Hindu king, Rana Raj Singh, in 1654. And from it, what she is trying to depict is notice a wording because 
the persons of great kings are shadows of God. The attention of this elevated class or the pillars of God's court is devoted to this. That men of various dispositions and different religions, mazhab, should live in the veil of peace and pass their days in prosperity. And no one should meddle in affairs of another. That's great. Just great. Now, if Aurangzeb was like that, he was really a great ruler, right? But then we know that actions speak louder than words, don't they? Now, what has happened over here is that correspondence is genuine. He wrote such a letter. And in the uh, import of the letter is that we should not discriminate on the basis of religion or masa. Fine. So that are the words of Aurangzeb, which Audrey Trashka is quoting. What we are going to do is we are going to verify whether his actions were in consonance with his words. So for this, I'm going to refer to translate uh, history of Aurangzeb written by uh, an eminent historian of India, Sir Jadunath Sarkar. What does he tell us about Aurangzeb's behavior? Let us look at it. In 1665, by an ordinance issued on 10th April 1665, the custom duty on all commodities brought in for sale was fixed at 2.5% of the value in the case of Muslims and 5% in that of the Hindu vendors. So, does this sound like someone who is not a bigot, who does not interfere on the basis of religion, who does not discriminate on the basis of religion? Absolutely not. This is actually what he did when he became the emperor. Okay, let's move ahead now. This was called the Mahsul or duty and must not be confounded with the Zakat or Tithis, which all Muslims had to pay on the annual increase of their wealth and the proceeds of which could by the Quranic law be spent on Mohammedans alone. Now this is one instance where he is deliberately charging double tax just because one party is Hindu as compared to those who were his own co-religionists. Let's move further. Two years after this, on 9th May 1667, the emperor abolished the custom duty altogether in the case of Muslim traders, while that on the Hindus was retained at the old level. See what has happened? Earlier, it was in the ratio 1 is to 2, Muslims had to pay only half of that, but now it has been totally removed. Apart from the political immorality of favoring one creed above all others, the direct sacrifice of public revenue was very great. And the real loss to the state was likely to be still greater as the Hindu traders had now a strong temptation to pass their goods off as property of Muslims in collusion with the latter. So this is another example of Aurangzeb's untrammeled bigotry. Let's move ahead further. Now, it had formerly been the practice of the emperors to apply a spot of paint tika with their own fingers to the forehead of great rajas when investing them. Early in Aurangzeb's reign, the prime minister was ordered to do it for his masters. But in May 1679, 10 years later, the ceremony was altogether abolished as savoring of Hinduism. So that is how discriminatory his policies were. Let's move further. A third instrument of policy of putting economic pressure on unbelievers. Unbelievers means kuffar or kafirs. That means non-Muslims was the granting of rewards to converts and the offerings of posts in the public service on condition of turning Muslim. So he was an active proselytizer using the dual mechanism on one way, on one side, you are penalizing them financially by levying taxes on them, whereas withdrawing all the taxes from Muslims. And on the other hand, you are actively facilitating conversions by doing what? By granting rewards to converts and the offering of posts in the public service on condition of turning Muslim. The revenue drawn from entire population was spent in aiding the mission propaganda of the dominant minority. Infidels were bribed into accepting the royal faith by the offer of money, 
allowances, robes of honor, posts, liberation from prison, or succession to disputed property. Moving ahead, Hindus were excluded from public offices. Now, try to remember it this way. At that point of time, when Aurangzeb was ruling, it is estimated that the Muslim population of the subcontinent was about 10%. And what was he doing? He was excluding the majority of the subjects from government jobs. From time immemorial, service in the revenue department had brought daily bread to middle class Hindus able to read and write. Under Aurangzeb, Kanungoship on condition of turning Muslim became a proverbial expression. And several families in the Punjab still preserve these letters patented in which this condition of office is unblushingly laid down. So, all state mayors are being taken to do what? To convert Hindus into Muslims. And that is why you see a proliferation of Muslim population in our country, today even. Next, there were other temptations as well for seducing Hindus from their faith. Some of the converts were by the emperor's orders placed on elephants and carried in the procession through the city to the accompaniment of band and flags. Others got daily stipends, four annas at the lowest. Most of the new Muslims, however, were only granted food money for the month following their conversions. And circumcision and then dismissed with robes of honor. So dear Audrey, I know you blocked me, but you must be watching this show. This is how history is presented. Okay, next. Hindu fairs put down. On certain days of the calendar, the Hindus all over India hold fairs near their holy places. And what was done? The Hindu festival of lamps, that is Diwali, and spring carnival Holi were ordered to be held only outside bazaars and under some restraints. Try to imagine a country, the home of Diwali and Holi, having 90% population as Hindu who celebrated it. One despot sits on the throne and he bans those festivals. And after 400 years, a white-skinned historian comes from a, an eminent Western universities and tried to guilt trip us into believing that we are bigots. He was a very genuine emperor. Anyway, let's move further. Uh, what Audrey Trashki does next is, let us see. Again, she quotes a letter which he writes to Shah Jahan. I wish to recollect that the greatest conquerors are not always the greatest kings. The nations of the earth have often been subjugated by mere uncivilized barbarians and the most ex extensive conquests have in a few short years crumbled to pieces. Notice how ironic it is going to be. He is the truly great king who makes it the chief business of his life to govern his subjects with equity. See, because word equity has been added by Aurangzeb in one of his correspondences to his father, the father whom he himself imprisoned later on for his entire life. His letter is being shown because the word equity has been mentioned. Now we have to remember that Aurangzeb was that person who imprisoned his father for life, who beheaded two of his brothers and one brother had to run away and died as a fugitive. Aurangzeb got his own sons killed because of power. And we have letters from Aurangzeb which he wrote to his brother Shuja. Uh, sorry, Murad. He had formed an alliance with Murad and they were trying to fight against both the other brothers. And in those letters, what he is saying? He is saying that I am not interested in ruling. I would just like to live like a fakir because I'm such uh, a religious man. So these are the words of a person that I don't want to be a king who ruled for 50 years, nearly 50 years. 
So again, she's quoting what she's doing is she's quoting his words and hiding his actions. And what we're going to do is we are going to focus on his actions. Next, what she does is Ishwar Das, writing in Sanskrit, called Aurangzeb Dharma, that is righteous, and his text is Vidhivat. So here the trick that she is using is she is using a Hindu name, uh, a Hindu worker of Aurangzeb. Now what can a worker do? Since he is going to earn his bread and butter from the emperor, he is supposed to praise and extol him. That is exactly what Ishwar Das was doing. But this is being presented. This was presented by Audrey Trashke as a proof of Aurangzeb's nice disposition. And as far as taxes are concerned, which Ishwar Das is saying as Vidivat, we've already gone through them. What kind of discrimination was being perpetrated in the name of taxes? The next trick that she plays is, huh, this is her master stroke. Several people have now what she is doing is look at the bottom 1659 imperial order or farman from Aurangzeb. What does it say? Several people have out of spite and rancor harassed the Hindu residents of Banaras and nearby places, including a group of Brahmins who are in charge of ancient temples there. You must see, okay, what we can do is we've got the timestamp of this. I'll show you what she was actually saying. Let us hear her out. As they say, hearing from the horse's mouth. Botched Mohammedan richest empires. A fully acts as emperor. Aurangzeb issued an imperial order to local Mughal officials at Benares that directed them to halt interference in the affairs of local temples. So this is part from the order issued in February of 1659. Aurangzeb said he'd learned that, quote, Several people have, out of spite and rancor, harassed the Hindu residents of Banaras and nearby places, including a group of Brahmins who are in charge of the ancient temples there. The king then ordered his officials, quote, you must see that nobody unlawfully disturbs the Brahmins or other Hindus of that region so that they might remain in their traditional place and pray for the continuance of the empire. Throughout his reign, Aurangzeb issued dozens of similar orders that direct Okay, I hope you get the drift. What she's trying to proclaim is, what she said is important, part of that Farman she is showing. And now let us look at the part of Farman that she showed us. Several people have out of spite and rancor harassed the Hindu residents. So since some residents were harassing Hindus, therefore Aurangzeb gave an order that they should not be disturbed. Now let us look at the original document, why not? Jadunath Sarkar gives us this document. It was the first Farman that he ordered. And here is the Farman. It has been decided according to our canon law that long standing temples should not be demolished, but no new temple allowed to be built. And this is the portion which Audrey Trashki has deliberately removed because if she shares this portion of the Farman, where he is exclusively forbidding construction of any new temples to Hindus in their own city, the oldest city of the world, then his bigotry will be at display. And that is what she has hidden from us. Let us read it. It has been decided according to our canon law that long standing temples should not be demolished, but no new temples allowed to be built. Then after that, she has picked it up. Information has reached our court that certain persons have harassed the Hindu resident in Banaras and its environs and certain Brahmins who have the right to holding charge of the ancient temples there and that they further desire to remove these Brahmins from their ancient office. Therefore, our royal command is that you should direct that in future no person shall in unlawful ways interfere with or disturb the Brahmins and other Hindu residents in those places. That is what she is doing. And she has the audacity to come into India and perpetrate her brazen lies. And she gets away with it. And when somebody uh, tried to point her out, she started playing the victim guard that, oh, I'm a woman and you don't like being uh, talked over 
or you don't like a woman to be talking to you, playing that standard victim card. Anyway, now that from that particular slide in her uh, presentation, she was trying to depict uh, Aurangzeb to be a very benign ruler who was supporting ancient temples of India. Now let us look at what he actually did. This is a Farman of November 20th, 1665. In Ahmedabad and other Parganas of Gujarat in the days before my accession, temples were destroyed by my order. They have been repaired and idol worship has been resumed. Carry out the former order. This is the real Aurangzeb. The actions which he took are indicator of his bigotry and his despotism. The village of Satara near Aurangzeb was my hunting ground. Here on the top of a hill stood a temple with an image of Khanderai. By God's grace, I demolished it and forbade the temple dancers Murlis to ply their shameful trade. Aurangzeb to Bidar Bakht. This is actual Aurangzeb in all his glory. And this is not all. I mean, we can keep on going on. I'll share with you some of the instances which are mentioned in his own uh, Akbarats. Akbarat are the uh, court documents. I'll quote them from, I'll just present some quotations from his own documents. Yes. Now he issued a Farman in 1669 on 8th of April during Ramzan. What does it say? The Lord Cherisher of the faith learned. Okay, I'll share it with you. That will be a better idea. I've got this presentation with me. Just bear with me for a few seconds. I'll share it with you. By the way, this presentation is also in Hindi available on Sangam Talks. You can watch it over there. Here it goes. On Thursday, the 8th April 1669, occurred an eclipse. Prayers were said and the arms distributed as was the custom. The Lord Cherisher of the Faith learned that in provinces of Tatta, Muslim, uh, Multan and especially at Banaras, the Brahman misbelievers used to teach their false books in their established schools and that admirers and students, both Hindu and Muslim, used to come from great distances to this, these misguided men in order to acquire this vile learning. His Majesty, eager to establish Islam, issued orders to the governors of all the provinces to demolish the schools and temples of the infidels and with the utmost urgency put down the teachings and the public practices of the religion of these misbelievers. Then what happens further? Saif Shikam Khan was appointed Fajdar of Mathura. Abdul Nabi Khan and Dilir Himmat, son of Bahadur Hilla, that of Nadarbar. Brahma Dev Sisodhya was appointed to accompany Saf Shikan Khan, Sayyid Abdul Wahab, messenger of King of Machin, had audience. Salih Bahadur Mace Bearer was sent to demolish the temple of Malarana. Okay. Then it was reported that according to Emperor's command, his officers had demolished the temple of Vishwanath at Kashi. And this temple, mind you, is still demolished, a mosque was erected over there and still we are trying to get, we are trying to reclaim this temple. On Saturday, the 18th September, Ekataz Khan and Girdhar Das, Sisodhya had a fight in the course of their watch before the Lahore gate. The Hindu went to hell. The Khan received five wounds. Now, this is, it. these are official documents of his court. And whenever a Hindu dies, Hindu goes to hell. And when a Muslim dies, he drinks a cup of martyrdom. Okay. Now this is the month of Ramzan, 1670. During this month of Ram Ramzan, 
abounding in miracles. The emperor, as the promoter of justice and overthrow of mischief, as a knower of truth and destroyer of oppression, as the zephyr of garden of victory, and blah blah blah, issued orders for the demolition of the temple situated in Mathura, famous as the Dera of Keshurai. In a short time, by the great exertions of his officers, the destruction of this strong foundation of infidelity was accomplished. And on its site, a lofty mosque was built at the expenditure of a large sum. This temple of folly was built by that gross idiot Beer Singh Devapundela. Before his accession to the throne, the Emperor Jahangir was displeased with Sheikh Abdul Fazl. This infidel became a royal favorite by slaying him and after Jahangir's accession was rewarded for this service with the permission to build the temple which he did at an expense of 33 lakhs of rupees. Notice an amount of 33 lakhs of rupees had been spent in those times and the temple was demolished by this bigot whom today Audrey Trashki and her ilk are trying to portray as a benign ruler. Okay, let's move forward. Twenty seventh January, sixteen seventy, Ramzan fifteenth. Praised be the august God of faith of Islam, that in the auspicious reign of this destroyer of infidelity and turbulence, such a wonderful and seemingly impossible work was successfully accomplished. On seeing this instance of the strength of emperor's faith and the grandeur of his devotion to God, which means Allah, the proud rajas were stifled. Rajas means Hindu kings were stifled. And in amazement, they stood like images facing the wall. The idols, large and small, set with costly jewels, which had been set up in the temple, were brought to Agra and buried under the steps of the mosque of the Begum Sahib in order to be continually trodden upon. The name of Mathura was changed to Islamabad. This, uh, I'm highlighting the portion, you can read this. Now, again, this is another temple for uh, Bhagwan Krishna, which is called Dera Keshavrai in Mathura, which Hindus are still fighting a legal battle to reclaim it. Okay. Then he partially destroyed the Sita Ramji temple at Soron. One of his officers slew the priests, broke the image, and defied the sanctuary at Devi Patam in Gonda. 7th April 1670, news came from Malwa that Wazir Khan had sent Gada Beg, a slave with 400 troopers, to destroy all temples around Ujjain. A Rawat of the place resisted and slew Gada Beg with 121 of his men. These are from Akbarat, and all these have been translated by Sir Jadunath Sarkar from the original Persian. Then again, Emperor learning from the newsletters of the province of Orissa that at the village of Tilkuti in Medinipur a temple has been newly built has issued his august mandate for its destruction and the destruction of all temples built anywhere in this province by the worthless infidels. Therefore you are, in, you are commanded with extreme urgency that immediately on the receipt of this letter we should destroy the above mentioned temples. Every idol house built during the last 10 or 12 years, whether with brick or clay should be demolished without delay. Also, do not allow the crushed Hindus and despicable infidels to repair their old temples. Reports of the destruction of temples should be sent to the court under the seal of the Qazis and attested by pious Muslims. These are just a few examples. 
Okay, I am noticing in the comment box that some of you are asking about the sources. Hmm. These sources have been taken. Uh, the references which I'm giving have been taken from the original documents of Aurangzeb. And uh, the book is called Masiri Alamgiri, which has been translated from the original sources. See, the system in those days used to be that in every province, there were people who were known as Vakya Navis. Their job was to note down everything of uh, significance taking place. And then after every four days or every seven days, these uh, instances would be rolled up in a paper, put in a bamboo stick, and that bamboo stick used to be carried to the capital, where they were all collected and published as Akhbarat. And that I'm reading out translations from them. So that should give you a picture of what was actually happening, what kind of a person was Aurangzeb. And now what I've presented here are just few instances of his bigotry. I can keep on going. Okay, I'll share one more with you. Here it goes once again. Now, Darab Khan was sent with a strong force to chastise the Rajputs of Kandela and demolish the great temple of the place. Notice this is continuously happening. 1678. Okay, this is uh, death of just one thing. This is not related to our today's topic, so I'm skipping this. All the aims of the religious emperor were directed to the spreading of the law of Islam and the overthrow of the practices of the infidels. He issues orders to the high Diwani officers that from Wednesday, 2nd April 1679, in obedience to Quranic injunction, till they pay commutation money, that is jizya with the hand in humility, and in agreement with the canonical transition, traditions, jazia should be collected from the infidels, zimmis of the capital and the provinces. Many of the honest scholars of the time were appointed to discharge the work of collecting jizya. May God actuate him, blah, blah, blah. So, once again, jizya was levied. Now, what is jizya? Most of you know about it. I'm not going to go into those details. I guess that should give you a fair picture how Audrey Trashki was trying to uh, portray Aurangzeb as a benign ruler by a bunch of lies and I am really surprised and aghast at the uh, brazen manner or the blatant manner in which he goes about telling these lies. Anyway, that's it from me. If you have any questions, I will be willing to take them up. Tushar Patelji, thanks a lot for your contribution. Thanks a lot. Amasmi Azad, oh my god, 100% more. Yes, absolutely. We actually have not been able to fathom the depravity of these rulers so far. It was such a harrowing time for Hindus that I sometimes uh, wonder what kind of people they were and what kind of hardships they went through. Uh, Parvati Subramanian ji, thanks a lot for your contribution. Ramanand Sharma ji, you are saying it should be in Hindi. Well, I am trying to cater to English population also. That is why I decided that I will have some of my streams in English. Krishna Tripathi, can someone tell me the source? I am Yes, I am telling you the sources. Uh, the sources that I have shown today are one from Masiri Alamgiri. Masiri Alamgiri, uh, the court chronicles of Aurangze. Translated by Jadunath Sarkar. And the second source I used is History of Foreign Save, which was written in five volumes again by Jadunath Sarkar. I could have quoted the History of India as told by own historians, 
compiled by Elliot and Dawson, but then Audrey Trishke says that that is colonial propaganda. Rajesh Kumar ji, like, share, subscribe. Yes, absolutely. All of you should like, share, subscribe, contribute. All these things should be done at the earliest. What I'm seeing is that still the number of likes is not very large. Okay, we have a question from Ritesh Khansa. Do we have complete list of temples Aurangzeb destroyed? Yes, uh, no, we don't have complete list, Ritesh ji. Um, actually, what has happened is that at very large number of places, the exact location of temples is not given. Sometimes what happens is, uh, I'll try to give you, uh, let me see if I can find out that uh, reference. Because what happens is that many places, they're just writing, many temples were destroyed. Okay, I'll share one of these with you. Here it is. On Saturday, the 24th, January 1680, since it is Akbar Aap newspaper, that is why you will notice the date and year mentioned. Second Muharram, the emperor went to view Lake Uday Sagar, constructed by the Rana, and ordered all the three temples on its banks to be demolished. News came that Hassan Ali Khan, having crossed the pass on Wednesday, had attacked the Rana, who had fled, leaving his camp and property behind. In this expedition, much grain was captured by the soldiers and it led to cheapness. On the 29th, Ali Khan brought to the emperor 20 camel loads of tents and other things captured from the Rana's place, reported that 172 other temples in the environs of Udaipur had been destroyed. Now, 172 temples, no names are given. No exact locations are given. It is in the environs of Udaipur. So that is the kind of references that we find very frequently. The tower masqueraded. 22nd February, first Safar went to view Chittor. By his order, 63 temples of the place were destroyed. So that should give you a fair amount of idea the kind of iconoclasm, the account of uh, the amount of temple destruction that was being perpetrated on express orders of foreign safe. I hope Riteshi that gives you some idea and also gives you an idea that why we cannot actually locate all these temples. That brings me to another very interesting lie which Audrey Trishke is trying to perpetrate. In this very video with the part of which I've shown you, she says that uh, another such lying historian who goes by the name of Richard Eaton. She says that Richard, Richard Eaton has claimed Aurangzeb got 12 temples destroyed. But Audrey Trishki is so magnanimous that she says that about 15 temples were destroyed by Aurangzeb. And if you, the evidence that I've just shown you tells you that the temple destruction that was carried out was at least in hundreds, if not in thousands. That is why I'm saying I was aghast, appalled, shocked at the sheer shamelessness with which these lies are being perpetrated. And uh, AVP, thanks a lot. Uh, I just read your question, how to confront Audrey directly. Yes, if you have to confront her directly, I suppose you must be in the location where she's present. And you should have all these sources with you. What I'm presenting over here is, okay, what I'll do is, after this uh, broadcast ends, I'll put the link, a uh, downloadable link in the description box so that you can download these books and present these facts and confront her because that is what needs to be done. In fact, that is the primary reason I'm uh, doing this live in English so that people can, all those people who understand English and non Hindi, they should be able to get a fair amount of idea of what was happening and can confront such lies. Amlan Jyoti, 
you must provide about this video coming in community tab okay i'll try to do that in future try to do that okay any other questions if you've got Kshetajam and India still glorifying him to insert Hindus. Not only that, see the Muslims in India are also victims. It is just that they are either so timid or so shameless that they are not willing to accept that they, their ancestors were raped, pillaged, forced to get converted. And see what happens is there is this uh, term which is called Cognitive dissonance. They are brought up with a liberal dose of the propaganda that they are into some wonderful faith and their ancestors were very smart that they switched over to Islam. Right? But when they are faced with these facts, then cognitive dissonance is that the facts and your perception are not matching. So one method of reducing that is to alter the perception or to alter the facts. So you will find Muslims trying to do either of these things so that they don't have to undergo the agony or they don't have to avenge the wrongs that were done against their ancestors. Uh, a few of them are courageous enough and that is why we see a very large number of ex-Muslims nowadays who are apostates of Islam. And as their critical thinking abilities will increase, as that truth will dawn upon them, we will see more and more people leaving Islam and coming back to the fold of Hinduism. Aditya Dhar, Neeraji, your work is invaluable. Thank you, Aditya Ji. We need a hundred people like you to spread the truth about our history and open our eyes. Aditya Ji, try to become one. And we don't need hundreds, we need thousands of such people. Because what is happening is that the liars are very brazen, they are at the positions of authority and they are perpetrating their agenda very shamelessly. We have to counter this just with the fact, just with the help of facts. That is the power that we have, but we have to do it and everyone should try to pass, participate in that. Naveen Kumarji, thanks for your support. Aparnadesh Pandey ji, thanks for your support. Nitin ji, thanks for your support. Vishal Patel, thanks for your support. Okay. Achyut Singh and Neeraj ji, can a secular government pay salaries to religious preachers? Ideally it should not. But then we know the kind of secularism that is being practiced in our country. That is exactly. In fact, in our country, secularism is a euphemism for Hindu bashing. And that is what has been going on. Okay. AVP. How to respond to ordinary Mughal temple destruction justification with Hindu kings also did same. Absolutely not AVP. That is another very blatant lie that is being perpetrated. I have not seen a single single uh, such event in which a Hindu destroyed a temple. In fact, uh, I've had a very long legal battle going on with NCRT and I had challenged them to produce even a single, I had not challenged, in fact, Sitaram Goel who was a brilliant historian. He had challenged all these historians that he was not asking even for two instances. He said, just give me one instance in which a Hindu king had destroyed a Hindu temple. Not a single instance is available. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, I, I can understand that because see what happens is there is always at the back of our mind this idea that maybe somebody will come up with this. But now I am sure that it never ever happened. Why I am so sure? Let me share it with you. When I was uh, fighting against the distortions of history in NCRT books, I had filed a case in Punjab and Haryana High Court, filed a petition over there. That petition 
by the directions of court was sent to NCRT. And there again, I had contested the same thing that kindly provide us instances in which Hindus have destroyed temples. Now, NCRT sent my petition to JNU, right? So what I'm talking of is NCRT and JNU, two of the places where these Marxist leftist missionary historians, jihadi historians are in full strength. They wrote these books and they sent me a 200 pages reply about my entire petition, but not a single instance of temple destruction. That is my confidence because I've gone through this. So you should be confident enough to know that if somebody is saying so, they are bluffing. <clears throat> Sir, is it true that Aurangzeb had maximum Hindu employees in his court as compared to other Muslim rulers? Uh, yes, because he had a very large empire and he needed Hindus to see it was working either way. You, you can extend it further. When the Britishers were here, they were even lesser in numerical strength as compared to Mughals. They had maximum number of Indians under their employment. So that is a very stupid argument that if they're employing, that was their, uh, what should I say? They didn't have any other choice. Like as I've already shown you, Aurangzeb specifically, okay, what I'll do is I'll show it to you. If I have it with me, just let me check. Aurangzeb specifically ordered that uh, all Hindus should be dismissed. Let me try to find it out if I can spot it right now. Just give me a few seconds. Okay, here it is. Now I'm taking it from, sorry. Uh, History of Aurangzeb written by Jadunath Sarkar. It is volume three. I'll just share it with you so that you can also have a look at the uh, original document. Here it is. In 1671, an ordinance was issued that the rent collectors of the crown lands must be Muslims and all viceroys and taluktas were ordered to dismiss their Hindu head clerks, peshkars and accountants, divanian and replace them by Muslims. As the official historian of the reign exultantly points out, by one stroke of the pen he dismissed all the Hindu writers from his service. It was found impossible to run the administration after dismissing the Hindu Peshkas of the provincial governments. But in some places, Muslims replaced Hindu Karodis, that means district rent collectors. Later on, the emperor yielded so far to necessity, so far to necessity as to allow half the Peshkas of the revenue ministers and pay masters departments to be Hindus and the other half Mohammedans. So that should give you an idea that if he was employing Hindus, that was not because he was very benevolent or he loved Hindus. It was that he did not have any option. He was trying to deliberately create options by dismissing all the Hindus, but the situation did not permit that. Vladimir, the handsome Terminator, Hindu Raja sirf murti pratis thapit karte the. Haanji, bilkul thik hai. Kahin se aise bhi bade kam instances hai. There are very few such instances in which idols were removed and then they were uh, again be stored at their own temples. Okay, so I guess that's it for today. We don't have any further questions. Yes, I hope AVP, I hope you got your reply. We'll do that. Okay. 
gates. Hmm. Faiz Khan. Sir, a question. Brahman Hamesha Dalits ko kyu maarte hai? Faiz Khan ji. Apne buddhi durust kijiye. Sabse pehle iske liye evidence la ki dijiye ke kahaan par Brahmano ne Dalitoon ko maara hai. मुसलमानों ने कितने काफिरों को मारा है इरेस्पेक्टिव ऑफ यर कास्ट एंड क्रीड एंड कलर वो तो मैं आपको करोड़ों में बता सकता हूं विद एविडेंस बताऊंगा विद प्राइमरी सोर्सेज बताऊंगा लेकिन आप ये क्वेश्चन पूछ के बड़े अपने आप को स्मार्ट बनते हैं क्योंकि आपको मुल्लों ने उल्लू बना रखा है तो थोड़ा सा अपने आप पढ़ने का प्रयास कीजिए और प्राइमरी सोर्सेज लेके आइए Russian MIG. Sir, government has a list on data destroyed temples that time. बहुत सारी information है. सीताराम गोयल जी ने दो पूरी किताबें लिखी हुई हैं. Hindu temples, what happened to them? उनमें उन्होंने sources quote करते हुए मंदिरों की list बताई है. तो government के पास सब कुछ है. Government चाहे तो सब पता कर सकती है. ठीक है जी आई थिंक दैट इज इट फॉर टुडे बिकॉज आई डोंट सी एनी फर्दर क्वेश्चंस जी तो थैंक यू वेरी मच इसे प्लीज शेयर लाइक सब्सक्राइब एंड प्रमोट द वीडियो एज मच एज पॉसिबल सो दैट सच फॉल्स हिस्टोरियंस लाइक ऑर्डर ट्रस्ट की कैन बी शोन दियर ट्रू फेस थैंक्स फॉर ज्वाइनिंग इन थैंक